אנחנו בתהליך, בינתיים אני אומר לכם שמצפה לנו סימפוזיון ואחרי הסימפוזיון הנוסף יהיה קטע של נגינה אה, סביב הפרויקט שלנו של סולמות שאני אדבר ואסביר עליו בהמשך. המוזיקה במוזיקאית. המוזיקה תהיה בשפת המוזיקה, לא בעברית ולא באנגלית. עד שהאורחים שלנו מגיעים לאט לאט, אני בינתיים מספרת לכם. אה, הייתה צריכה להיות פה תזמורת של מאה ילדי סולמות מהפריפריה, אבל יש היום מבחן מיצב במתמטיקה. אז לא אפשרו להם בתי הספר לצאת, למרות שהכל אורגן מראש, אבל תהיה לנו נציגות שנדבר עליה לאחר מכן, אז תהיה לכם אפשרות לשמוע משהו מתוך הפרויקט. I apologize for not letting all our distinguished guests time to breathe, to rest, and to see what is around them, but we are very anxious to continue, and next time we will have to arrange it with more free time for all of you. Uh, you can come right up, Professor Ekman. You can just climb right up instead of sitting down and letting me bring you. And we are now to the second symposium, which is going to deal with education prevention and treatment. And it's a real, real honor. I've said before that the list of prizes are so long that if I start uh, telling about all these prizes, I will not end uh, reading it to you. But I don't think I need to present Professor James Heckman, who is among all other prizes, the recipient of the Nobel Prize in 2000. Yes, 2000. And uh, we're very proud to have him here. And uh, we're very proud that the Dan David Prize will go together with the Nobel Prize. We like it in Tel Aviv University to say that we also gave a prize, not only the Nobel. And I have the privilege the honor and the excitement to invite you to talk and share with us your idea. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I, 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 do, I, I do enjoy very much. I realize it's been too long since I've actually been in Tel Aviv or even in Israel. Uh, but the interactions the last few days have just reminded me of uh, how much I've lost, and I hope we can continue these interactions uh, on, on into the future. So what I've been asked to talk about, or what I'm going to talk about anyway, is creating and measuring capabilities. And uh, I want to, I think it links very well to the discussion we heard earlier about the global uh, macro aspects of inequality both in Israel and around the world. And so let me, let me, uh, let me talk uh, uh, briefly about this. Oh, I see, I have a clicker here, so I'll use this. So uh, let me start, though, with where I actually started, or concluded maybe, uh, in a lecture a couple of days ago. I had a few minutes to talk at the actual award of the uh, Don David Prize, uh, but I actually went back to uh, the Bible and uh, just to remind you, and these are actual quotations, so you can read it. The, 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 the traditional approach to poverty, now I'm talking about traditional going back. We're going back to the very beginning here, at least in terms of uh, organized uh, religion. Uh, this admonition, there should be no poor among you. Uh, but with immediate qualification, of course there will be, if however there is somebody among you, that you should basically be kind, at least to your kinspeople, and do not harden your heart against the needy kinsperson. So that again starts a policy which has been 
really traditional in, uh, in, in many countries, Western countries, uh, from, from, from thousands of years, which is transferring. But also recognizing that poverty is going to be an ongoing problem. And it attacks poverty in a way that is kind of traditional, but I think limited at point of view from what we understand now about poverty. <clears throat> so we've seen this already. I decided to bring the coals to Newcastle, but you know already about the nature of inequality in, uh, in Israel, so it's probably better, uh, I'm quoting literally one of the previous presenters here. So we know that inequality has increased, the percentage of households under the poverty line. We had a very good discussion of this uh, next, uh, last, last session. What I want to talk about is a relationship between inequality and social mobility. Because in many countries, in many societies, the real interest is not so much in poverty in the current generation, although that's an issue and has profound political and uh, economic uh, consequences, but also to consider um, social mobility, how people can advance. And so this is something that I, I definitely I, I want to focus on. And here is a graph which many of you have seen. I put the best estimate I could find, although I'm sure people here could come up with a better uh, number. Just this so-called Gatsby curve, or the Great Gatsby curve, which relates intergenerational mobility, looking at some measure of income of the child uh, to the income of the parent. Uh, and this coefficient beta is called the IGE, the intergenerational income elasticity. A higher beta is lower mobility. And what people have talked about, Korak in particular, but others, many others now, Chetty more recently, have been looking at the relationship between income inequality, this is income inequality among families uh, in various countries, and looking at what the rate of intergenerational income mobility would be. And you see this positive relationship. The more cross-section inequality, the greater the immobility of the population. So that's a real, that's an empirical fact that's been found. Uh, I number, each of these numbers can be disp disputed, but the fact of the matter is that, that there's a general pattern along these lines. And so if we look particularly at countries like Denmark, uh, the US, and then this number for Israel is one of the only numbers I could find. Uh, and I don't know if you would accept it, but nonetheless, there it is. There is a close relationship. So uh, the real question is, how do you interpret this relationship? And what's the policy interpretation? And what might we take from it? So one way to think about it, and the way that most people, many people anyway, Alan Kruger and Korak and many others have interpreted this, and I'm not saying it's an invalid interpretation, is the relationship goes from income inequality uh, to basically uh, the IGE. The idea being that as societies become more equal, some people have access to resources. Their children, those at the high end of the distribution, have access. Those at the bottom do not. And so inequality would feed into this immobility. So we, we start with an inequality, and we might preserve that inequality. We would preserve it. And it could be a situation of either continuing or possibly worsening the inequality. So that's one interpretation. The second interpretation, though, and it's one that goes back to the work of Gary Becker and Nigel Tomes and others, Glenn Lowry, is the notion of how the intergenerational income elasticity itself promotes income distribution, namely, how family influence, how the transmission of a family influence and family uh, resources and family generally translates into the inequality of the individuals in a society. So an open question is as to whether or not we, which mechanism or wh the relative importance of these mechanisms, both are probably at work, but it leads to different kinds of policy conclusions. And so the, the standard notion and I put this in uh, italics, is to think about redistributing. That's kind of the Bible's view of the poor. You know, help the poor, give, sometimes called alms to the poor. We have a very sophisticated analysis now in economics of welfare state and how we might efficiently redistribute resources. So 
the notion of income distribution uh, leads uh, to a kind of a notion of redistribution and efficient redistribution. But the other notion here, and I want to emphasize this, is something that I would call pre-distribution. Namely, understanding the role of family influence in producing uh, income and equality. And so both of these should really be taken and, and, and considered seriously in devising and analyzing policies. And that's what I want to primarily focus on today. I want to emphasize a point that was made, though, or just repeat a point that was made in the previous sessions in the papers, very good, very interesting discussion. Namely, when we're talking about creating skills, we're only talking about part of the issue of inequality. I mean, obviously, how people can use their skills, what the incentives are uh, to use the skills, how efficient the society is in utilizing the skills and incentivizing individuals to acquire those skills plays a major role. And I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. But right now, I'm going to focus on one part of the story. And it looked like in Israel, at least for certain populations, it may well be still an important component of thinking about inequality. So I'm going to use the term capabilities. And I'm borrowing this term from uh, work by Sen and Nussbaum and others. Uh, but it's a very general and intuitive concept. So without getting into the specifics of Sen's capability approach versus somebody else, I just want to use the term almost as a synonym with skill. And thinking about capacities to function and create further capacities. I think those kinds of skills, the, the ability to self-realize, to enhance one's abilities, to kind of achieve various goals over life, those are very important. And these capabilities are going to be what I focus on. So I'm going to make the equivalence here between capabilities and skills. Now, for those of you who know Sin's work, you'll recognize there's another whole political and social dimension about institutions, which I'm abstracting from completely. So if you know that literature, you'd know this as internal capabilities. I think these are very important, and this is what I want to talk about today. So I want to emphasize this point and come back to it, that the capabilities of individuals, invested in individuals, only part of the story, but they're a very important part. And so uh, I'm going to focus on this throughout it. So what do we know? I'm going to talk very briefly about a, what I consider to be a comprehensive approach to forming these capabilities. But I want to also emphasize that when we think about skills and capabilities more generally, um, we really are thinking very broadly. We need to think more broadly about what the benefits are of these skills. And this does change the way we think about social policy. And here's an example of what I mean by fragmented solutions. Typically, in public policy discussion, people say we want to reduce crime. Crime is a contributor to inequality and as a consequence of inequality. But when people think about addressing various social questions, they think about you know, promoting skills. If you're going to promote skills, it's almost always equated with building better schools, paying teachers more, and raising test scores, like we heard earlier uh, today. And then, of course, if you want to promote health, you have more doctors and you have more medical facilities. And if you want to get nutrition, then you hand out supplements. You maybe expand the agricultural sector. If you want to reduce pregnancy among teenage girls, you have pregnancy prevention programs. And then the biblical notion about reducing inequality, giving transfer programs, or more recently promote various kinds of programs. I'm not suggesting that any of these programs are, very, are bad. But I am going to suggest there is a more comprehensive approach that supplements these kinds of standard solutions. And in some cases, when we have actually computed it, we can see that certain ways to prevent crime can be much more efficient than hiring police. We can actually do a, a cost-benefit study and suggest that uh, certain kinds of ways of promoting, uh, reducing crime by promoting education can be far more effective, cost-effective, in terms of reducing crime at a given level than hiring police. So I want to emphasize today the policy synergies that come from a unified approach. And I think that's really very valuable, because it means that we think about these policies in a much broader way. It's not just changing income, although it does do that, but it also is giving a wider set of skills and the capabilities to people to function in society. So what I want to emphasize in, in this talk, and what I really want to dwell on, is the powerful role of these capabilities slash skills in shaping life outcomes. And so 
the theme that I have is basically, and this is very important from an empirical standpoint, uh, if we have like millions of capabilities and millions of uh, uh, potential skills that we might operate on, then it doesn't become very tractable as a theory. I want to argue the evidence suggests a low dimensional set of skills, capabilities, uh, explain a lot of diverse socioeconomic outcomes. And reductions in inequalities among those capabilities can be a powerful source of reducing inequality and promoting opportunity in society. And secondly, uh, societies are based, in part anyway, on the way that, uh, cap on the capabilities of the people. So we know that increasing the skill levels really very important. And I want to show you how important. And when the thing that's very, very important to keep in mind is when we look at, and I use the word cause very deliberately, that low levels of these capabilities cause major social problems. So when we think about a unified approach to social policy, we want to think more broadly about a range of outcomes that would be achieved, uh, more than is typical in much of the discussion about public policy on these matters. So then what I want to, want to argue is three points, and I'll just go through and try to demonstrate the value. Family plays a very important role. I don't think I should emphasize that too strongly here uh, in Israel, where the, the traditional Jewish family has been very, very powerful in supporting the life of the child and so forth. I just heard at lunch from C about the role of uh, the Talmud in creating <laughs> success among the the Jewish population in Poland in 1500, uh, the, t the teachings. So that's, that's something that's, but still something that's easily neglected. And the family itself is under change, not just in Israel, but around the world, maybe more dramatically around the world, but it's still a major question. The second point I wanna emphasize, and it comes up from what the discussion earlier today, uh, and it really kind of, uh, not contradicts it, but suggests we might broaden it, is that multiple capabilities are important. There's been such an emphasis in, for the last 50 years about uh, cognition as being an important component of human uh, capability and human flourishing. And that's true, that smart people do better generally than dumb people. But it's also the case that I would say that in the last 40 or 50 years, societies and public policies have become focused almost exclusively on measures of cognition. I mean, the IQ test is 100 years old uh, the achievement tests that we use, like PISA scores and so forth, those go back about 80 years. But we know that more generally, successful education systems in the past emphasized a broad range of capabilities. So in some sense, the progress of science has led, in some sense, in, at least in education, the focus on cognition has sometimes led to forgetting some other important uh, aspects of human flourishing. And I want to talk about those and how we measure those. And then finally, I want to talk very briefly about what I've called, and called the co-authors, the technology capability formation. How it is that these skills get formed and what we know about the, uh, the timing. And this is something that I think uh, is, is new and it's exciting because it brings together work in economics, it brings together work in uh, biology, neuroscience, and uh, across many fields, education, sociology, and the like. So what are the eight recent lessons that I would talk about from the recent literature on creating skills? Let me just give you what they, uh, what they are, just to broadly, very crudely. First of all, multiple skills. Uh, multiple skills matter. I can't emphasize that enough. Non-cognitive skills, social and emotional skills, health. We know at an intuitive level they're important. What we've come to understand in terms of prediction and even interpretation, causality, is that understanding the, the multiplicity of skills, when those skills are formed, how they interact and how they help create further skills, that's a huge issue to recognize, that it's more than just being, having a high PISA score or having a high um, IQ that matters. In the US anyway, when we study it, IQ, variations in IQ among individuals explain four to five percent of the variance in the income over the lifetime. It's a, it's a small part of the story. Uh, long ago, John House had a paper uh, about looking at IQ effects on earnings in Sweden, and the title was something like, uh, if, you, if you're so smart, how come you're not rich? 
And I think that, that's the kind of obvious uh, point. So that's the first point I want to emphasize. Secondly, there are substantial gaps in skills. And those gaps in skills emerge relatively early in life. They, they widen in some cases, and they're very important. And they are important contributors to inequality, at least in performance in society. The third part, and this is really very, very important when we think about skills, is understanding the dynamics of skill formation. In many quarters, I doubt it's no long, I don't think it's no longer kind of widely accepted, but many places and many even intellectual environments, and I know that even in the Obama White House as recently as three or four years ago, there were these books, these popular books that received a certain salience that were providing a notion that genetics played a major role in shaping skills, that, you know, that uh, basically heritability still plays a major role in thinking of many people. About 20 years ago, there was a book called The Bell Curve by Charles Murray, Her uh, Murray and Herrnstein, Herrnstein and Murray, and they basically were, in the end, arguing that genetics still played a powerful role in explaining abilities and in shaping inequality in society. And the one thing we've learned, and I think we've learned it very well, is of course that any, th any of these skills, even including IQ, and certainly things we measure by achievement tests and these social and emotional skills, they have a heritable component. That heritability factor varies depending greatly on the family environments that individuals grow up in, uh, but they can be created. So there's a scope for social policy. That's the third lesson that I think we want to take from this. And the fourth lesson is something which is emerging. I mean, from biological studies on animals, like you know, rats and mice and so forth, where you can actually do laboratory experiments, to more recent work on human populations where we have conducted experiments with long-term follow-ups, we have found evidence, I think that's consistent with work in neuroscience and in other fields outside of economics and ordinary social science, of what you want to know as critical and sensitive periods. That there really is, you know, like a time and a place for everything, to quote the Bible, and there really is a sense that, that there really are critical periods, even critical periods, Unless intervention or stimulation is given, uh, it can lead to permanent consequences. An extreme example, for example, is iron deficiency. If somebody grows up at a very young age and does not have iron or, uh, for that matter, vitamin A, those can lead to impairments. In the case of iron, low IQ, that's very difficult. We know that insults like lead, uh, when, when applied early on, very difficult to remove in terms of impairing the IQ. But in a positive note, we also know that in the early years, the first decade or so of life, uh, malleability of things like IQ is very high. I mean, there's a lot of room for, for, for training and growth. But we also, and, and for other, other skills like uh, social and emotional skills, there's malleability that seems to occur even in later life, into the late teenage, young adult years. And that, again, roughly corresponds to work in neuroscience about the prefrontal cortex slowly emerging. So we know, and, and, and many, many, uh, many social practices uh, are based around that, but we can now get better evidence on it. But the role of the family is critical. I mean, it's critical and understanding how the family works is an ongoing research frontier. We think we know it. We have a lot of intuitive understanding. But as the family changes and the nature of family life changes, then the nature of how the society might adapt to those changes in family life to still guarantee or at least give promise to the children of those families, I think has to adapt. And I think that's an important lesson. So understanding the family and its powerful role. And this is where I would actually go and maybe contradict the notion. We talked about a lot about measuring money and so forth. But I think if you look historically and also from some of the evidence about where what so-called successful families in terms of the outcomes of their children, that money, obviously at an extreme level of extreme starvation, resources matter. But parenting plays an important role. And it's, sound, it's something that we typically take off the public policy table, and we've understood it, and we understood how we might actually supplement parenting. So I won't talk about that. But I don't want to start with this notion that Everything is over at the early years, that it's only the first few years of life. Um, 
those years are very important. They build the base for what comes. But it's also the case, especially I mentioned the, the slowly developing prefrontal cortex, the emergence of uh, social and personal skills throughout the life of an individual, that the structure is suggesting that even in the adolescent years, even in the young adult years, there are ways to change and ways to in affect intervention. And, but the interesting thing is, if you look closely at what the successful interventions are, they're kind of age-adapted parenting. It's parenting. I mean, so uh, Dennis Robertson, you know, has this great quotation years ago that, that what, what, what is it that economics is, uh, economizes on? What's the fundamental thing we economize? Love. Because, you know, basically, the altruism is not a good way to organize modern society. You go to the marketplace, you're not going to... Uh, you know, altruistically make exchanges and think too much of a merchant who's selling you an apple or something. But we know that love, especially in the early years, and this kind of parenting and mentoring throughout the lifetime plays a huge role. And that's in more than just kind of a, a vague statement. We can actually have evidence. I'll show you some evidence on that. And then when we get more deeply and think about what the parenting is, a lot of economists, and I would argue educators too, have a model of what parent-child relationships would be. And some of the model even consists of kind of, here are the children, and, uh, yeah, and here's the teacher, and I'm lecturing to you, and you're listening. But that's not a real model of education. A real model of education is adapting to the individuals, what uh, uh, some child development psychologists call scaffolding. And so the development of interactions and understanding that what's going on is a relationship between the parent and the child, that's a huge uh, area both of research and of public policy. And so, and then I, I can't help but conclude that the early investments that lay the base are extremely important. So let me just, uh, how much time do I have left? Oh, great. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you some evidence about this instead of just making statements. So the first thing I really want to emphasize, and this is an ongoing research area, is understanding the importance of cognition, character, and health. Uh, it, it is something that I think it's, it's uh, ignored in thinking about evaluating schools. You know, it's natural. I mean, all empirical social sciences or sciences fix on standard measurements, taking those measurements over time, interpreting them, very important. But I think we've come to understand we need a more general measurement system. And there's one that's under development right now. So I'll just cite, this is a little bit of self-citation, but some of you can download from OECD. OECD, the very group that uh, has promoted the PISA score in the last uh, 20, uh, 30 years, has recently now recognized the importance of non-cognitive skills. So you can go to the website. I wrote this with Tim Kautz and and these other co-authors, international group, where we're trying to look at the structure of what cognitive and non-cognitive skills are to promote lifetime success. We review the evidence, and we find uh, substantial evidence of the success, and we then review a number of interventions across the life cycle that are effective. So you might find that a useful reference, but it's a free download. But here are some examples that are just uh, giving you some idea. And this is very crude, very aggregated. So what I'm doing here is putting, uh, uh, looking at various measures uh, of child of outcomes. These are adult outcomes using child measures. So if you ask, for example, and you come up on a standardized scale of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, and you move from the left to the right, you're basically moving up in the distribution. And so there's been a huge literature, huge literature, this blue curve. Hernstein himself wrote a book about IQ and the meritocracy. Uh, and also about crime and the relationship between IQ and crime. That's what this relationship shows. The more intelligent people either um, commit less crime or get away with it more easily. Yeah, either way, that's how I interpret this. But also, if we come up with measures of non-cognitive skills, we find a very sharp gradient. And so I'll just show you a few other figures. If you look at teenage pregnancy, using the same measures of these skills. These are not, this is not us cooking up a measure for each graph. We have hundreds of these graphs, and I promise you I won't show you all hundred, but they're in some of the papers. So here, for example, if we look at schooling and who, uh, who, goes, who graduates from high school, we see this is the multivariate graph, and you can see there's a nonlinear relationship. But if you look at the marginals, fixing the others at the mean, 
then what you find as you move from the bottom to the top, both cognitive and non-cognitive skills are very predictive of who graduates high school, who graduates college. So these are very, this is, and you can go through a number of outcomes. And I'm not going to show you all of those, but I can give you similar graphs. And we have in a series of papers a lot of graphs uh, showing all of these outcomes. So in that sense, what I'm suggesting is if we build this skill base, what we find is a large number of beneficial outcomes, including improvement in trust, employment, wages, reduced depression, enhanced self-esteem, uh, reduced smoking behavior, improved white-collar employment. This is all U.S. data, and it means it's conditional on the incentives that are in the U.S. system. That's the first point, the multiple skills. The second is one that's really important that people only recently did we really have the data to understand. So here I'm drawing on a study from a child development expert, Jeannie Brooks Gunn at, the, uh, uh, at uh, Columbia University. And here what you see is a graph, which won't surprise anybody if you look at the right side. This is telling you uh, cognitive scores by mother's education. So if you look at mothers who are high school graduates, oh, sorry, who are college graduates or higher, then you can see that their children generally have higher test scores than those of, who have some college, their children of just high school graduates and high school dropouts. But these are, again, American data. And what's interesting is that the gaps that are there at age 18, which more or less affect college going, are more or less there at age 5. And that's the important thing. And it's there, actually, at age 3. You can't measure these things reliably. And if you look at measures of social and emotional skills, it's in reverse order, so it's a little confusing. This is antisocial behavior, and it's in reverse order. But what you find is the gaps you find at 12 years of age are more or less there at 14. And the kids from the more advantaged environments are much better off in terms of these skills. But schools, which in America are quite unequal, are actually producing uh, substantial differences, uh, not, not, not really changing the gaps all that much. So how do you interpret the evidence? If you see a gap like this emerging, and if this were like 100 years ago, and you were a member of the eugenics society, you would immediately say, OK, this is genes, right? I looked at the mother. I looked at the child. They transmit the genes. And that smart kids, uh, smart parents have smart kids, and they have a lot of income and education. So what, what the modern understanding has come to, we've, we really parse this much more. I'm not saying it's fully resolved. It's an ongoing research area. But and there is a powerful role for genetics. I mean, on average, the heritabilities that are computed are about 50%, if you know the uh, ACE model, but it varies a lot. Family environments, though, we've investigated, and they play a huge role. Parenting and family decisions as part of family environments are really very important. And neighborhood and community effects, which are less researched, but we think there's evidence for. Uh, I'm not going to present a lot of evidence on it, but it's evidence that's starting to emerge. I can't help but show one graph, which I find very interesting, because there's still a notion of resilience among uh, the notion that, that genetics plays a powerful role. And so here's a graph that's very old now, 10 years old, 11 years old, which actually tells you something about identical twins. Even the economists who are supposedly quite sophisticated have thought, well, if we have identical twins, they have identical DNA, we should be able to sort of control for all the evidence of family influence and so forth. But it's not true. And that this graph, you can see, is just pairs of, twin, of, of DNA material uh, from identical twins, the left side and the right side. These are two different people. This is the, and these aren't the same people. These are identical twins, different parts of the genome uh, at, at, at age three and different parts at age 50. And the differential coloration is a measure of what's called gene expression. And what that differential coloration suggests, you know, genes do nothing by themselves. They only operate through their expression. And so as experience is uh, accumulated, we can see that the gene expressions actually change. And so this has been replicated. This is in human populations. In animal populations, there are literally thousands of studies that show the powerful role. And here, of course, you have Eva Blanca working on aspects of this here at, at Tel Aviv University. It's very important uh, work. And I, I will skip this because I am running out of time. But genes do play a role in the sense that, uh, that uh, you know, certain environments and certain genes predispose. But I, 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 just, I should skip that. So, that. so what do we know about the crucial role of mothering and mentoring? 
And this is family, parent, child interactions. Now this is again, I'm, I'm giving you very standard evidence and this is, these are, many of these graphs are just very traditional. Books are written about each one of these graphs. By, so there's a 30 million word gap which is based on this particular table, uh, which is based on work by Hart and Risley some 20 years ago. But what this shows is just looking at family environments and not only looking, so if you look for example of uh, the status of children, uh, the background of children, welfare being the lowest status uh, in terms of the uh, at resources available to the family and uh, the professional being uh, college uh, graduates and so forth. What you see is that each hour that the child is with the family, that there's an enormous gap. Here we see 600 words per hour from the disadvantaged children, relatively disadvantaged children, to almost 2,200 words per hour for the advantaged children. And it's more than just the uh, number of words read. It also is a very de real difference in the, in the parenting styles. And this is something which actually is not fully appreciated. So in some families, especially disadvantaged families, and I'm sure it's true in Israel, I know it's true in the United States, uh, that basically what you see is sometimes prohibitions. Don't do this, don't do that. And whereas if you look at Woody Allen movies, <laughs> just the opposite, you know, uh, at least of the traditional Jewish family. So the point is uh, that no, but this, this is a serious issue. And some of this involves knowledge and some of it involves parenting practices. And this leads to substantial differences in, 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 and so forth. And you can see there, there's a lot of evidence on this. I don't have time. But I will point out that the family itself, the nuclear family, is under stress. This is from America, uh, where actually we're finding that close to 40% of all children, uh, sorry, 30% are living with a single parent. And the single biggest growth factor is single parent families, where the father has never been present. Now, this is a controversial discussion. If you were in Northern Europe, you know, where the cohabitation is very common and there's a lot of stable cohabiting arrangements, then that family arrangement is not a, necessarily a bad structure, although it remains to really be studied fully. But in the United States, a lot of these families are not only low-income families, they're, they're situations where the mother is a teenage mother, she's not very advanced, she's down in the bottom of that graph that I showed earlier. So a lot of American children, anyway, are growing up uh, in what are considered now a growing fraction of these kids are growing up in families where they get less stimulation, which we can show has a huge effect. So uh, around the world, people get surprised. In Chile, like 50% of all kids are born out of wedlock. Mexico, it's like 55%. These are traditional Catholic countries, uh, and, but they still play, uh, have a huge role. And uh, here, uh, what I'm showing is um, uh, in, in, in the United States. So there are strong class gaps about teenage pregnancy. Uh, I, I probably, we know that, there, that among the advantage, we, we heard earlier today and over the symposia the last few days about how the more advantaged parents are marrying, more educated parents are, uh, are marrying, there's greater sorting on education. At the same time, the, the two family, uh, two earners in the family, so those families have more income, and they're reading to the child. And now if you look at a measure of time input, you will see that the more educated families, which are doing very well by those graphs that we saw, so there's a real income growth there, in addition are spending more time investing with their children. And that's even the case where, uh, give me 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> okay, so uh, I should, probably should show you a few more graphs. In Israel, it's less of an issue, but it's growing. And among some of the disadvantaged populations, it's substantial. Uh, so how are skills created? There's a dynamics of skill formation. This comes out of a standard model of investment. So I'll just show you a schematic. This is just basically a simple graph, uh, just showing how these different skills cross-fertilize each other. And they do so in a dynamic way. But it, two ideas that are very important to separate. In economics, we think a lot about this notion of complementarity. The more you have, uh, of one input that generally speaking, at least in a lot of areas, the more productive is another input to go with it, okay? So I think a high level of school, of skill, of one kind of skill, boosts productivity of other skills. That by itself could be a socially disequalizing notion. That if you really thought, about it, it could lead to a form of social Darwinism, saying, well look, some kids are, have a pretty good start. By 18, there's some 
big gaps. I showed you the gaps. So on a purely economically efficient basis, it would be better to invest in the high-skilled kids than the low-skilled kids. That's been the traditional argument. But that argument misses a key point. And that is the notion of dynamic complementarity. And this is where economic dynamics plays a very powerful role. And what it's suggesting is, sure, it's true what I just said, that more, more product. So we know that the rate of return to children who are very highly motivated and have very high levels of IQ can be as high as 22, 25% in terms of a year of college. Huge, huge returns. But what we also know, and what the modern literature has shown, is the dynamics of, 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 of skill formation. And so what happens is that even though you have that complementarity that suggests investing more in the advantage, you can build the skill, uh, skills of the disadvantage. And in fact, it can be shown that uh, under certain conditions, which I think are empirically satisfied, if you invest more today, there's a huge return because you build a skill base to capitalize on that later stage complementarity. So I call it, we call it dynamic complementarity. And this comes out of a, is an argument, a formal argument I won't present, but nonetheless there's evidence that supports it. And so what this suggests is that even though kids may start off very poorly, there are real gains, especially because of the critical and sensitive periods that early in life uh, to investing in the early years. It builds the skill base and you can actually get higher returns for investing in the disadvantaged. But society typically, when it treats the disadvantaged, waits until problems occur, okay? So, um, so dynamic complementarity increases with age, and that gives rise to, a, to an interesting dynamics where the skill base, if you promote the skill base now precisely because it percolates over the whole life cycle, you're gonna exploit that complementarity and lead to high economic gain. So there could really be very low, almost no, there's still a tax cost, but there's less of a trade-off between equity and efficiency. What's socially fair can also be economically efficient. So, um, and then there's also an alternative solution, which is we should only wait for problems to appear. And that's a legitimate concern. So if you start making investments and against things we, and, and inefficient ways, then you could argue, well, we maybe we should wait till 18. We don't attack crime early on uh, what we do is we attack it when the kid commits a crime at 17. And in some sense, you know you have a criminal and you catch him and incarcerate. But the question always is, how well can we target and advance where the children are vulnerable, who the disadvantaged targeted children would be? And the answer is, at least in this area, we have a pretty good knowledge base to suggest that targeting uh, early on can be efficient. And later life remediation is less effective, I, and, and I mentioned earlier, can I have five more minutes? Five more minutes? Exactly. You've heard of the self-renewing uh, uh, <laughs> flame, right? So uh, I will keep, uh, the oil will keep pouring for it. So, okay, so, no, I'll, I'll finish up. But I just want to, so, but I don't want to leave the notion that it's only early childhood. Early childhood is very important. And compare, if you look at most societies, most societies adapt the strategy of saying, let's solve, let's, let's treat the problem once it appears. And what I'm suggesting is we're starting to get enough knowledge that we can actually prevent the problem and do so effectively. But you know, knowledge still has to be uh, acquired. So early life conditions are not the full story. Resilience, and in fact, that OECD report, we document a number of interventions that turn out to be effective for adolescent children. Uh, and what they are essentially is providing parenting, uh, age-adapted parenting, okay. So um, I would argue that investment properly made is mentoring, emotional support, and scaffolding. So I will, um, I guess I don't really have time to go through some of the other evidence. So uh, talk about the determinants of education. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just show you some small amount of evidence on interventions and their impacts. And one I cannot resist is a program I've investigated and I'm still investigating now. It's a Perry Preschool program. Children were randomized uh, in a suburb of, of, uh, of uh, Detroit 50 years ago. They were all African American. They were chosen to be low IQ. Um, the children received what is apparently a modest supplement. And the modest supplement is like 2.5 hours a day 
five days a week, two years during the school year, and received home visits. But the program stopped after the kids are uh, entering elementary, uh, kindergarten. Now what's interesting, the curriculum was not sort of teaching baby Einstein or having them solve math problems. What it was was actually having the kids come in every day, plan a task, do the task, and review the task. And they visited with the parents. And if you look at what the outcomes were, and I really will stop, so don't worry, I will stop, eventually. Uh, um, it was at scaffolding the children. So it's kind of individual attention, but it wasn't cognitively focused, per se. What, it, what you found, actually, and this is something that really percolated around the world, some 40 years ago, you found this with Head Start, that the treatment group had a high IQ, then it faded relative to the control. The control caught up. And so people said, this is a failure. But the failure was the inability to realize that other dimensions of human success are required. And we look at, so we actually, we randomly assign these kids when they're you know, 50 years ago, and now they're 50 years old. And now we can follow, what did they do over their lifetimes? And yet it turns out, if you look at the rate of return, adjusted for costs of public funds, so it's including the welfare cost of taxation, you're getting a rate of return of 7 to 10% per annum. And the main channel was through these social and emotional skills, something completely neglected. So it's an interesting case when you think about fade out. So anyway, uh, the mechanism is through social and emotional skills. And I will just say that when we actually followed another project, which we're still also following now until age 45, a group of where we started even earlier, IQ was actually boosted in a lasting way. You had lasting gains in IQ. And what was totally unexpected was that there were health benefits. Why? Because these people had greater self-control. They actually took, they listened, they, they took medical advice. And so the treatment group, again, randomly assigned, has much better measures. And we're actually converting this, we have converted this, into a rate of return. So if you include the health benefits, you're getting like 11 to 13% per annum as a rate of return. So uh, I should uh, just say that the mechanisms by which this works primarily, and how these programs are actually operating, isn't just so much working with the kid, that's part of it, but it's also changing the parent who stays with the kid. And it's that kind of scaffolding and recognizing it's a program not just for kids, but for parents. Parents are there for a lot longer time. And uh, that's been a kind of a neglected dimension. So I really should, uh, I really should stop Although there's a lot of interesting stuff I could talk about, but uh, but I would I do want to say in terms of uh, Pro Professor Fisman's uh, uh, report, we have looked at this question about nutrition. Everybody's worried about nutrition, and I have a map similar to his, probably the same map about stunting. Okay, and so there have been a lot of studies that have been done exactly to supply nutritional supplements to avoid stunting. And what's interesting about these is uh, work done by Sally Grantham McGregor. I've done some work uh, with her and so forth. So we have a lot of issues about vitamin A deficiencies and so forth. But when we studied an intervention that was given in Jamaica that was primarily given to improve the nutrition to avoid stunting, the only effective arm of that intervention, the one, on, the one you see in the middle, the one that brought the stunted kids back to normal, was one that not the one that just gave them nutrition, but gave them nutrition plus parental stimulation. And it turned out the parental stimulation arm was extremely important. That was only 14 months. We followed these kids to age 22, and we, in a report we had in science a couple years ago, we get uh, huge wage gains, 22% uh, increase uh, in, in wages. So anyway, I should, I should stop uh, and uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, but I do think this is a very uh, challenging area, and I think it's, it feeds into the discussion earlier. But I'd also agree completely that you need to get the right incentives. Now, Cuba has actually very high levels of some of these cognitive and non-cognitive skills. They invest heavily in early childhood. But we know the Cuban economy is not doing too well. So there are other issues that matter. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Heckman. I'm sorry I'm the witch with the watch and that I need to stick on timetable. I think it is fascinating, and I think that everything you said could be a beginning of a whole symposium. And um, 